<clears throat> I want to welcome all of you to the Yale Fireside Chat on uh, cybersecurity uh, 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 careers. Uh, this is the fourth uh, in a new series of Fireside Chats that are focusing on career-related issues uh, and uh, as opposed to our Yale career panels that we've had on individual professions uh, that we've been doing for many, many years. Uh, the Fireside Chats, uh, we've, uh, the first one was on the challenge of major career challenges, uh, changes rather. The second was on uh, serving on boards and the third was on the art of networking. And uh, we had a very good turnout for all of those. Uh, the the uh, uh, Yale career panels, uh, we've done 26 of them now covering pretty much every profession that we can think of, although I guess uh, there are new ones to, uh, that we think of uh, all, all the time. Uh, but we've covered architecture, law, medical, uh, you know, film and drama, et cetera. And we have one coming up uh, on uh, uh, later this month uh, on uh, uh, the uh, startups. And so we have three uh, Yale alumni who will talk about the joys and trials of startups. So those of you who uh, might be interested, uh, please uh, register. Um, this topic on cybersecurity I'm very excited about because you can't open up any major magazine, newspaper, or, or, or so forth without this topic uh, uh, coming up. It is an extraordinarily important topic. Uh, it's both, uh, it, and one which uh, is very important because uh, it presents all sorts of issues between countries, et cetera, right? And, and also uh, criminals, right, as, as we know. Uh, what we try to do in each of these fireside chats is to try to have really someone who we think is really uh, one of the very best at the topic. And I'm very pleased uh, to, uh, to have encouraged Jason Healy, who is one of the leading experts on cybersecurity, to participate uh, in this uh, fireside chat. Uh, he is at Columbia University, and he leads their effort on the cybersecurity. Uh, I think if you look at his uh, background from the invitation, you'll see he has really an extraordinary uh, career uh, uh, in, in the area, and I will ask him at the start of this fireside chat to just talk about his career and, and, and the highlights. Um, again, we're going to try to focus on really um, career choices, uh, jobs that are possible, uh, uh, what are the characteristics of people who uh, do well or, or not do well uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in this field, uh, and also um, uh, some of the international aspects, which is an area that uh, Jason uh, knows quite well. So uh, with that, what I'd like to do is just say the following, which is that we will start out uh, going through the questions, and I, it'll be kind of a discussion format with Jason. Uh, and then we want to make sure that we leave plenty of time at the end uh, for questions from the audience. And there are going to be two ways that you can uh, ask questions. One is you can use the chat function, which you'll be able to see uh, somewhere on your screen. And you can just type in your question, and we'll be able to see it and uh, answer. The other is you can click on the Q&A one, which allows us to uh, hear you uh, if you have your um, camera and, and microphone on and we can, uh, we can talk to you that way. So it's really up to you, but we'll, uh, we'll make sure we'll have uh, plenty of time, at least 15 minutes at the end for, for Q&A. So with that, what I'd like to do is uh, first start out and, and say, Jason, you know, you have had a really, uh, uh, you know, an, a very amazing career in the area. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you could walk us through, uh, you know, how you got into it and what your experience has been and so forth. Yeah, so I, I got started in the field. I mean, my path started because uh, uh, I really liked the movie Top Gun, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is not a normal way to get into cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. But um, I decided I wanted to be a fighter pilot, and that got me to the Air Force Academy. And um, the uh, I turned down pilot training and, and went into intelligence instead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's a way that uh, a lot of people tend to get into the, or some people tend to get into the field. Either they were veterans or um, especially if they're working in communications or intelligence. And I came in through that path. So mm -hmm. I helped set up the first Joint Cyber Command back in the, in the late 90s. Mm -hmm. And then uh, did that for uh, a couple of years then moved over to Goldman Sachs and set up their first computer emergency response team. So this is one of the teams that um, helps find vulnerabilities beforehand, um, 
develop response plans and then help coordinate the response to computer incidents inside the bank. Mm -hmm. And uh, from that, having the military and the finance expertise went to the White House for a couple mm -hmm, of years, mm -hmm. uh, not to help improve their security, because I'm not that technical. I was helping, you know, what's the, what's the overall policy that we might look at? What's the overall policies that we might do for better cybersecurity in the finance sector, mm -hmm. for example, or the energy sector? Um, went out to uh, uh, Hong Kong for a couple of years uh, with the bank, uh, with Goldman Sachs again, uh, to do business continuity and crisis management. And then after that, decided I really want to do more writing, thinking, and teaching in the space. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, uh, it's interesting because uh, actually experience uh, uh, in cybersecurity for a uh, financial institution is actually very serious because they're a prime target, right, for hackers and so forth. Uh, which I know since I run an investment bank, okay. it's you know they 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 really 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 work on trying to uh, penetrate firewalls and so forth. So uh, I think if you had a hat company and so right. forth, it might be different. But if you're an yeah. investment bank or a bank, <laughs> that's a serious issue. Uh, yeah, it's definitely true, and and that's because they've got the the finance sector tends to be far ahead because uh, the senior executives get it; they understand that they're going to be targets. Um, if someone's a banker, like an actual banker, they probably care more about confidentiality. If right. someone's a trader, they care more about availability to make sure the systems are going to stay up. Uh, but everyone's going to, they're all willing to spend money on it. It's a regulated industry. So they're willing, so they know that the regulators are, are watching them. And uh, so you really feel this, this drive um, in the field. And also they know they have to work together, right? right? So banks are counterparties to one another. So even when they're competitors, they know that they've got to share information and talk frequently um, with the other banks in a way that you don't necessarily see um, in some of the other sectors. So it really was a great crucible for me to learn mm -hmm. in a place that was willing to, um, to take it seriously and put the management attention on it. Okay, so you never got to be Top Gun, but I suspect. <laughs> do you every once in a year you 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 watch top, uh, you know uh, Top Gun and you know reminisce? No, uh, no much <laughs> much much better fan of the hacker movies now. You know the the war games, the sneakers, the the hacking movies. Oh, war so, games, and that was yeah, a good that was yeah, a good one, right? That was a good one. So uh, let's start out with this thing. You know, one of the biggest challenges in uh, talking about certain careers is that there's so many different ways you can be mm. right i mean cybersecurity there's so many different professions underneath the you yeah. know the title so uh you know not to tongue tie the audience or whatever but could you maybe sort of take the big picture and say if you thought about the you know sort of the major chunks of you know types of careers that you could think of uh you know what would those be and you know you know how are they different from each other sure the uh, certainly the the main path that people come in that when you when you see there's a new national strategy to try and uh, bring more people into the field and the rest they're talking about the straight computer science and that and that's absolutely critical but you don't see a lot of that on my resume for example um, it's people that are coming in they, they typically had a computer science background maybe an information systems or, or related background maybe they've done intelligence um, our communications in the military and and there's a whole there, there's many many disciplines under that but they're all rooted in coming in with that technical some people will be um, uh, writing code uh, and writing code to improve firewalls or develop a new firewall or um, some will be looking at malicious software and trying to unpack it and see what's in there and reverse engineer it and figure out what happens others will look at um, try and pick apart Microsoft or Apple software and see if they can find bugs. You can sell bugs for a million dollars, more than a million dollars, if you can find a significant vulnerability. And there are companies that just do that. You know, people, you know, individuals that will do that for three months, make a couple million, and then peace out for the next nine months and hang out on a yacht. The, um, and so that's, that's really rich with a lot of different ways um, for people that can make a wonderful living out of it um, and stay really intellectually challenged. But of course, not everyone's coming in with that computer right. science background. Um, and those are the people that I tend to work with more nowadays. And, and they're not, and they're not geeks, are they? Uh, <laughs> some, some, <laughs> some, some are, are yeah. Okay. I mean, it's, right. <laughs> uh, they might not be, um, hardcore nerds yeah. of, um, opening up a command line right. and just diving in. Mm -hmm. 
but in the sense of they're intellectually curious, they love to problem solve, and they don't mind technology interacting with the technology to some degree right. to explore that problem and find their way through it. But and, that's the area that gets, when people talk about cybersecurity, that's the area they first think of, right? Absolutely. They don't think of the other areas like a policy. Right? Absolutely. And, uh, and that's why I find my, you know, being you know, really an evangelist for these other areas and, and to push the other ways. The, the most important thing is if you're not coming in as a computer scientist is when you're looking at that computer screen, it can't just be magic on the other side of it, right? right? If you're looking at your phone and you just have no idea how these things, how these apps work and how they interact, then you're going to be in, in trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but if you can even just get a little bit past that, even just a tiniest bit of understanding the way programs work, about HTML that delivers web pages work, of how networking works, that then it's no longer magic, and then your brain can start to process these other yeah, areas. So the other two main areas that I, that I wanted to talk uh, well, there are a couple areas that I wanted to talk about. Um, one is, is maybe closest to the computer science side, and this is where a lot of my students come in mm -hmm. to this, is threat intelligence. Because uh, here we have a lot of international affairs and public policy students coming mm -hmm. in. Because they can write, they can think, they can understand the world mm -hmm. and t geopolitical tensions. Because right, a lot of people that are coming in from the cybersecurity side, they will look at and say, all right, was this Russia that was behind hacking the DNC election? Yeah, yeah. Was the United States behind Stuxnet? And they'll be great at looking at the technical artifacts of that. But they, they don't necessarily understand how to communicate that. They don't understand um, national security. They don't understand right. regions. They don't have language expertise ne necessarily. And so that's where I find a very rich area for international affairs students so to come in. So that's like tying, so you're, you're, you're tying the threats and the technology to what the implications are for policy and so forth, right? Right, yeah. right, right. right. And, and not just looking at the technical lines of evidence. Yeah. But what are the other lines of evidence? Yeah. So it really is this, this sleuthing, mm -hmm. and you're using some of the things that the techn technologists are giving you, right. um, but you're also bringing in the things that you learn in international affairs or with your regional expertise or, or, or the rest. Um, you know, here I've got friends that have companies that hire, uh, they call them like the ninja linguists, you know, the folks that really understand the culture and the language. Um, not just the conversational level, but, you know, we need someone that's going to understand metallurgical terms, <laughs> right, <laughs> right, you know, right, right. and so, um, uh, so, and that's a, that's a very rich area and one that I've spent a fair amount of time on. I have a lot of um, my own students that have been going that area. You also see a, a rich area in business and uh, business cyber risk. Yeah, obviously. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. That's, and that's so a huge part. And, and so in all of these, you know, having some of the tech, technical understanding helps, but right, if you have to go and have a communication with the board of directors of a company, mm -hmm. or, or think about the role of cyber insurance, or looking at these risk frameworks, right, that's not something that a, that a hardcore technology background is necessarily going to help you to understand, right? It's, it's good to be able to communicate, to understand business, to, to have, you know, a business under, uh, you know, undergrad or, or, um, uh, or, or a business graduate school degree. Um, and that ends up being a very different. And then there you're, uh, and if you're looking at threat intelligence, then you can be going to um, a government agency, CIA, NSA, uh, DIA, DHS. You can be thinking about one of the major banks or other big companies that have their own threat intel team, um, or one of the major cybersecurity companies or threat intelligence companies like FireEye, um, CrowdStrike, Microsoft, if you're thinking about the business cyber risk, yeah. uh, you're, you're aiming for, you can be thinking about the banks, you can be thinking about um, the large consultancies uh, like PwC or McKinsey that all have um, uh, wonderful groups in that. Um, you know, I suspect there's a lot of that that happens in the, um, in the Yale Cyber Leadership Forum, which is partners with McKinsey, so I suspect there's a lot of that going on. So, but if, if say you wanted to end up working in cybersecurity at General Motors or whatever, is it better to go through one of these firms that actually focus on that and then migrate to that or so to develop certain skills? Uh, right. I, th I think it's going to depend on what you're able to line up mm -hmm. coming out. You know, if, if you're coming out of school, 
-hmm. to me it's a lot of it's just going to come down to the offer yeah um but what i found in being in the way that i got here was able to arbitrage arbitrage back and forth right you know when i went to goldman sachs they said this is our government guy (laughs) and when i went back to the white house they said this is our goldman sachs guy (laughs) yeah yeah. and and i was able to flip keep flipping back and forth of getting the advantage of that so if you're if so you know general motors would love to have someone that's coming out pwc or um or kpmg or accenture um uh, and but it's also vice versa so i would you know i think it comes down to the offer and, and what the offer is and where the location is going to be but it strikes me just listening to what you say is you actually uh you could you could come from a whole variety of backgrounds and uh and educational backgrounds and end up in cybersecurity. Uh, yeah, i mean it? it could be technical it could be political science it could be you know mm-hmm. international you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, government. You know, issues. So it sounds like, uh, yeah, you, you, so this space is one where you don't have to start out saying, okay, Correct. I have a certain major and that's the only way I can get in. Right. Almost all of us, well, to a large degree, we're migrants from other places, yeah. right? There aren't very, there still aren't very many cybersecurity, um, degrees. So most of us are coming in from some other area. I'm glad you used the migrant word, not the I word, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. I was going to say refugee, but, and there's one other. So we've talked about three areas so far. We've yeah. talked about computer science, uh, threat intelligence, business risk, and there, there's um, two others that are related and I'll group them together. And that's technology policy and, and, and cyber policy. Mm-hmm. And so uh, working with a, with a policy school, we, uh, I talked to a lot of students that are interested in broadband policy and closing the digital gap, uh, the digital divide and privacy issues and, um, you know, issues of algorithmic bias and these other areas, you know, and this is, te- I, I, this is technology policy. Um, and it's very similar. And, and there you've got, you know, a, a relatively wide range of places that you can go to, right? It opens up think tanks and, and NGOs. And we, I have a fair number of students that go in those places. I don't necessarily consider that cyber. For me, Cyber policy is that subcategory that's also looking at, well, how does this fit in with international affairs? How does this, um, what are we thinking about if we're talking about cyber deterrence? It has a little bit maybe more flavor of international security policy in this. So you might have people that are international affairs or security studies majors. Classic places uh, to do this might be um, State Department has a, um, actually just just today, they are having a new bureau that's going to be looking at it at digital and cyber issues, right? Mm-hmm. What's what's internet governance going to look like? How should we deal with the Russians and, and have negotiate with them on what the future right. of the internet is going to be like? DHS has a shop that does this. Um, you know, the Pentagon and other places have places that do that, that do this. Um, on the straight cyber policy, mm-hmm. though, as fascinating as it is, there might be fewer jobs for that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, than in other places. And in case anyone that that's tuned in uh, is a lawyer, or there's also or or hardcore public policy. There's also government relations jobs, right? But those tend to be very um, fewer of those, and they do tend to prefer lawyers for that, or someone with ex- uh, with a high degree of public policy experience. Well, so you cover lots of areas, and cybersecurity would be just one of them, I guess, right? right. In that case, right? So you know, I, I I listen to what you're saying, and I say, wow, you know, if I'm a young alumni alumnus and or or I'm you know, graduating, whatever, it could be daunting trying to figure out if you, if you generally wanted to be in the cybersecurity space, it could be daunting trying to yep. figure out one, what area you should be in, but two, getting uh, the right kind of information to know what, you know, what it's all about. Right. Mm-hmm. So how, how does one figure this out? Right. Yeah. And I think that's true for a lot of professions, but it sounds like in this case, yeah. it's particularly true. Right. Yeah. The, uh, depending on, the where in some of their career path they are mm-hmm. i offer different kinds of advice and so if someone's in undergrad then i say pick early mm-hmm. um or if the or if you're early in grad school pick early um no if you can have at least a year to know that you want to start working in the cyber issues it doesn't just give you a chance to pick your courses which is important but not critical what I think is as critical as, as the, the course selection is the selection of papers. 
And so, you know, if you're, if you've got a class on great ethical philosophers and you want a class and you want to get into cyber, right? I want your paper to be Chinese cyber espionage, um, Nietzsche and the will to power, right? I mean, no matter what you're writing on, find some nexus. That's how, that's what I did when I was in this, when I was getting started, mm -hmm. every paper I could, I tried to tie to it in some way. So that way it gave, it got me used to what are the readings? What are the core books? that I keep seeing pop up. Um, and that way, by the time I came out, I had layered all of these papers together. I was used to writing on the topic. I, I, had, I had a body of work of my own, and I, none of it got published, but at least that I had done. And I had built myself up to that spot, even if, even if the class wasn't connected. And you can do that even in undergrad. Yeah. Um, the, I but think also, it, you, you, you build up a portfolio of knowledge, right? Ex exactly. That, that and you build on it class and after do, class. Right, yeah. And that way, when you're coming out and you're, and you're having those interviews, you can say, I wrote on X, Y, and Z, and it gives you something to talk about. Second, I said, you know, you're writing these papers. It is such a differentiator to be published mm -hmm. that someone else has, or, or to be an editor of a journal. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible difference. When I was hiring at the think tank at the, at the Atlantic Council, if someone had published something or had been an editor of a journal, immediately the top third. Mm -hmm. Now, this is helpful for threat intelligence, for policy, to some degree for business risk, um, that people know that you are an able communicator. Yeah. It's an incredible difference. Um, third, if someone is already in mid-career or in graduate school, um, I say look for that area, uh, and maybe undergrad, where you can pivot, where you can take who you are and what you've done, and that you can change that around to be good in this new space. Um, my, my favorite example was uh, one of my interns, he was an undergrad, mm -hmm. and um, Italian-American, and he said, my mother, she, she yells at me, she, she says, I'm studying political science, why, why do I think I can do a job in cyber, right? And, and she thinks I'm wasting my time. And I said, well, wait a minute, you're, you're native in Italian, right? You go back and you can't it, to Italy all the time. I said, for, the, for less work than it would do you for one three credit undergrad course, mm -hmm. you could learn, you could read everything that's ever been written on in Italian on cybersecurity mm -hmm. and, and publish on this, yeah. you know, and get a paper on it. And not that anybody necessarily needs the 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 leading expert on the East Coast on Italian cybersecurity right. issues, but it shows that you're an expert. Yeah. It shows that person on the other side that you care and committed and that you can learn and you can do this. And then I, when I interview someone, I almost never have, they almost never know more than me in a particular topic. Maybe well, if they're, maybe if they're I'm, hardcore. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> maybe if they're hardcore yeah. technical. But right, if you come in and say, you know what, I'm, I've read everything that's ever been done in Italy all of a sudden it changes the nature of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And I can talk with you as a colleague that knows something important that I want to learn. And that changes the nature of the interview. Now, what's, what's interesting about this though, is that also like all careers, uh, it's no longer true that you join one company and then you retire Correct. with Absolutely. a gold watch, yep. right? Yep. And the reality is 99% of the people, they, they, they not only change jobs, but they changed types of jobs right. too. Um, I, I was on the train, the Amtrak uh, train the other day and ha happened to sit next to two people who were with Homeland Security mm -hmm. yeah. and they were in the technology side. Oh, cool. yeah. And uh, of course they can't, couldn't say much, right? But mm. each of them, when you looked at their backgrounds, uh, uh, and, and obviously a big part of theirs is cybersecurity, right? Mm -hmm. They had gone through different careers mm -hmm. Uh, and ended up where they were, right? Yeah. So that's probably going to be true generally for people in general. Right? Absolutely. Uh, one question, though, is uh, what kind of person, and maybe the answer is you can't generalize, right? But if you think about the couple of different cybersecurity uh, uh, careers, as you mentioned, is there any way to generalize and say what kind of person tends to do well yeah. and, and, and what kind of person tends not to do so well? Yeah. Uh, you know, separate from the issue of whether the audience can be objective about themselves, yeah. but putting that aside, right? Hmm. Yeah, it is tough to generalize. I think we've got, you know, there's certainly some that are hardcore technologists 
and that's what they do. You know, they don't necessarily have the communication skills, don't need them, don't really care about creating a business, and, and they really excel at that. Um, the uh, the problem solvers, um, actually, almost everybody. I mean, I think if if anything, it's problem solving that really dives into it. One of the things that makes the field so rich and interesting is that you you have this. Everyone recognizes it's important. We've been recognizing it for twenty years, um, and there's still a lot of the core intellectual problems we haven't solved yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so really people that are coming in with that curiosity and can think conceptually and, and get those ideas across, I think make, make, a, uh, make, make an outsized difference in whatever they're going to do. One thing I'm going to say, which is rather obvious, is you know, in all these career panels and things, we've gone through all different professions, and some are declining. Mm -hmm. right? You know, uh, 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 some are, are, are growing. And clearly cybersecurity, one of the advantages of thinking about cybersecurity as some career is it's clearly a growth area. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's a clearly a growth area. Probably some areas growing faster than others, but overall it's growth because there's a need, right? And, and so that is a plus because yeah. all things equal, <laughs> it's easier yeah. to prosper in an area which is growing rather than shrinking or flat, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the and it's a place where uh, there's negative employment. If you can come in, and, and especially you can find, um, you know, you get get your resume correct, then there are going to be the jobs out there. When I was working at the Atlantic Council, this DC think tank, I would have interns come through, and I remember I was talking to one that was um, doing American defense policy was her was her the focus of her studies, and I was saying, oh, you poor poor woman, right? I mean, that's a great thing to study. I'm fascinated by the topic. Um, but it, it doesn't differentiate yourself enough. Mm -hmm. Um, my colleagues that studied NATO or, you know, the interns and others that studied NATO, yeah. when we at the Atlanta council, which was kind of our specialty to, to study NATO, when we would get together, right, we would have 25 white haired white men at the table, right? I mean, if you wanted to get in, um, we used to, we don't anymore, but right, you had two generations of experts ahead of you mm -hmm. that had held the key jobs. And if you were 25 and hungry and wanting to affect NATO policy, it's tough. It was tough to break in. It's yeah. tough to break in. Yeah. That is just not true in the cyber fields. So I was like, hey, just do NATO and cyber, <laughs> right? And all of a sudden, it would give them these new opportunities to sit at the table yeah. and have their voice and their ideas heard. One question, you know, uh, pretty much uh, every profession, well, first of all, if you have a, you're going to have a career as a lawyer or mm -hmm. as a doctor or an, or as an architect, uh, it's not a two-year career. It, it mm -hmm. can be 20, 30 years. So it's important not only to think about what does it look like to be in that profession today, mm -hmm. but also what it's going to look like through the whole period yeah, of your career. That's a great question, yeah. And, you know, for ex an example being uh, the whole medical profession is changing dramatically, yeah. right? So, you know, 20 years ago, you could be an individual doctor in a town and mm -hmm. survive, and you didn't have all these people having to deal with yeah. all this you know, insurance you know, claims and everything yeah. else. Things have really changed. So the, 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 the profession of being a doctor has changed dramatically, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and is continuing to. So if you think about the cybersecurity area, if you, for people who are just entering in, what do you think some of the changes might be over the next 10, 20 years that they have to consider as they think about a career in, in, the, in the area? Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. The, well, we know that uh, cyber conflict is here to stay and is only going to get worse. So the areas I was talking about, like threat intelligence, um, uh, uh, business risk, cyber risk, um, this ability to com communicate and take these the technology issues and make and make them germane for other people are absolutely going to be right on top of that. Unfortunately, I wish that weren't the case. The you know so you mentioned insurance, right? And folks that are you know, that can look at, at at cyber risk and how we insure it. It's a fascinating area. Um, it's got some aspects that are quite quant, but 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 not entirely. Communicating with the board; those are all areas that are going to continue to grow here. Um, Without a doubt, though, if uh, for myself and and uh, I want to, I need to learn more about big data, data sciences, artificial intelligence in particular, because mm -hmm. those are those are coming in um, more and more. If you're going to be an analyst, you need to have some familiarity with those 
uh, with with dealing with big data sets, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I, I can certainly see that certainly see that coming, mm -hmm. even to the point where a lot of the way that the U.S. government thinks about this, like mm -hmm. Cyber Command, um, they're just building out sixty two hundred people at Cyber Command to look wow. at um, offense and defense. Um, and they're going to be sitting on keyboards and helping defend or intruding into other people's computers. And I say, what is going to change for you when this goes AI? Yeah. Right. Just think in our in your field about how high frequency trading has changed the trading floor. Yeah. Right. You don't have this open cry pits um, where uh, where you've got these folks yelling at each other and trading commodities and, and stocks, right? Uh, there's still some of that, but it's or a the fraction of what Or the traditional uh, broker, if, he's a, right. if you're a broker at uh, you know, Morgan Stanley, all these robo-AI advisors right. yep. are really threatening their job. Right, and so now it's this interaction of the robots that's interesting. Yeah. And so whenever I'm a cyber kind of thing, how is your, where are you gonna have those 6,200 people chain uh, do when now that's run by algorithms and bots and the attackers are run by algorithm and bots. Um, and even in finance where we want the system to stay up, the, the bots yelling down each other can cause flash crashes and, and others. What are we going to do when, when it's an attack and defense? So we, we're going to Well, that's why it's good to be in cybersecurity it. policy because uh, I, don't, <laughs> I, don't think, uh, I don't think they have yet uh, develop the AI that can develop policy, as far as I can tell. Right uh, within companies, they're pretty good at it, but not, but not, but not at the level that we that we do. Either, so. That's right. So, uh, so this is a very exciting area. There's a lot of growth. There are a lot of different segments. So, actually, for those of you in the audience who are probably, you know, having looked at the registration list, we've got people with really varied backgrounds. So, if you're interested. Uh, you might be able to find an area that fits you. Oh, without a doubt, right? absolutely. It's and, very, very rich. Uh, if you're not a techie, well, then you shouldn't go in that way. But if you are, that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. So, by the way, uh, uh, I'm in the age group where, you know, uh, you just didn't use PCs that much, mm -hmm. right? And I remember I was running an industry group uh, at uh, Lehman Brothers, and I had what, what people used to call a decorative PC, right? <laughs> uh, because it blinked, but yeah. it, it wasn't being used. But I learned very early on, like you said, that if you're going to run an investment bank, you have to understand at least enough technology mm -hmm. to know, you know, how to bring in experts and so forth. So, yeah. so, so, I, you know, I taught myself to do that. But similarly, I think you each of these folks has to sort of say, what's the blend of skills, right, right. that I'm going to have to develop for where I want to go, yeah. right? And if you're, and if Folks are looking to not just understand this, but, but really move into this as a career. I'm always looking for that narrative. Yeah. But I, I was talking to one of my uh, students uh, just yesterday, and he had been working financial crimes for the New York uh, district attorney. Mm -hmm. And so he understood things like sanctions. Mm -hmm. And so he came to us, and he's now he wants to get understand these cyber issues mm -hmm. so that way he can – when he spits out of us on the other side, he's thinking about banks and saying, I understand anti-money laundering, I understand intelligence, I understand sanctions, um, I'm gonna te be teaching myself computer crime and fraud. Mm -hmm. So when I shoot up the other side, I've got this complete package mm -hmm. of national security and law enforcement financial transactions. And wow, right? And he's just got that path. And you want to say, what a great path. I want to help you on that path. Yeah, yeah. And the hiring manager and the managing director on the other side mm -hmm. is going to get that. Right, he's, right. Gonna, you know, he's enrolled in that narrative, and he can start understanding, or she can start understanding how she can help this young man as, he, as he's looking for what he's going to do next. Now, um, uh, although all of these uh, uh, people who are attending are, are Yale uh, students or alumni, mm -hmm. you are in fact at uh, at Columbia University uh, yeah. and at the School of International Public Affairs, which was one of the largest and leading uh, schools on international policy and so forth. In that arena, so a lot of the, you're you're teaching students who are who are by definition pursuing you know uh, often pursuing international careers. Okay. Yeah. Where do you see you know you've been teaching and so forth? Where do you see uh, you, the, your the students, you know, where do they? What types of jobs yeah. uh, are they getting coming out of an international policy school? We've had the the most luck in the cyber threat intel. 
and in fact, we just started a cyber threat intel class to to, to help make that happen. Mm -hmm. Again, because they, you know, we there's maybe a slightly higher percentage of veterans um, in that area, um, but uh, people that have regional studies, uh, they speak languages, um, they're they're excellent in writers. Um, they bring in, in analytical schools. And so that's where we've had our, our, our best success so far. Uh, we've also done well with the bank fusion centers. Mm -hmm. So banks will have these centers where they're bringing in all their cyber threat intelligence. They're looking across their own networks to figure out what's happening within their own networks. Um, maybe they're tying that in with anti-money laundering and fraud, um, like City is. Uh, and and that's been a great area. We've got we've got five right now at, at the City Fusion Center. So okay, we're, so we're they go to a variety area. of yeah, different, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. diff, different yeah. careers and so uh, on. U.S. government into um, uh, PwC's and and uh, the, the top consultants. So yeah, yeah, but I, but I hear that it's you know your area and courses are quite popular in part because people see this is an important area, right? Because it it, it matters, mm -hmm. right? because the yeah. world peace and all these things and security of companies is important. It's all, but it's also a growth area uh, where you can get a job, right? It, with, <laughs> Which with, is a, an important criteria, right? It, it absolutely is, but we, I find that the students sometimes worry about that bar to get in, of saying, mm -hmm. I can't be a cybersecurity person, I'm not technical enough. And so, you know, we just have to get them over that, that initial hump of, of seeing that they can do it. You know, they will have to take maybe a little bit of something if they can. Um, but that the most important thing is just understanding it's not magic. So. Yeah. By the way, if I confer, one of our Yale career panels was on government service. And, and mm, one of yeah, the things yeah. I learned there is uh, the route to get into government is a little more complicated. There's some rules about how you do that and so forth. So those of you who are thinking about going into government, just make sure you talk to someone who really knows the procedures and how that works because and it was very interesting. It was eye opener for me because I was less familiar. Yeah. But uh, listening to the panelists talk, they said, you know, it's rare that you can just go from an undergraduate into certain mm -hmm. government jobs. There's sort of a procedure and so forth. Yeah. And, and one of the things to consider that, uh, another thing to consider is being a political appointee. You know, you, whether you're young um, and you can work on a campaign and get known that way, or you're uh, maybe a little bit more senior. Um, but I've had a, a few students that, um, uh, you know, have been Democrat during a Democratic administration, Republican during a Republican administration. And, you know, they're looking for really, you know, talented, smart folks. And it's a great way to kind of circumvent the system of uh, that you normally get in, USA Jobs and things mm -hmm. like that. And just having someone, having a mentor that can make the right calls and get you in the right place, it, it, it's a, and we're having some luck with that. Now, I'm going to go off topic for a few minutes yeah. only because, you know, I'm I'm allowed to if I want, and I look at your background. What was it What was it like to be the director of cyber policy at the White House? Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, this has nothing to do with careers. I yeah. understand that, but since we have you uh, here, right? Uh, yeah, it was uh, it was absolutely fascinating because we we handled a, a wide range of issues. Um, the uh, this I was relatively early mm -hmm. in this, so by the time I took the job, there'd really only been one person in the chair. Before, before me, you, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, maybe one and a half, depending on how you count. Uh, so I was there 2003 to 2005. Mm -hmm. So still, so still quite early in the game, and so it was it was rather undifferentiated. Right? There were there were only a handful of us. We had um, and we each had a fairly large portfolio. Um, I was a bit disappointed because I didn't get to work the issues that I most wanted to. Right? I'd I'd been coming in as intelligence. I'd been coming in as military. I'd been coming in as finance. Um, and I really couldn't get my hands dirty in, in those areas. Mm -hmm. um, finance a little bit, but basically finance was so, had their act together so well right. between the banks, uh, what the banks had set up themselves um, for information sharing and for treasury. And so I ended up working in, in a wide range of other areas. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, but it was, it was absolutely, yeah. it was fascinating work and, and, and those networks that I got uh, are, are still really rich today. I suspect you had to interact with a lot of other government agencies as part of your job. Yeah, right? yeah, without a doubt. So a lot of our work was calling together the um, uh, the other agencies and, and trying to push policy, trying to push the president's priorities, trying to just keep everyone herded and going in the in the same direction. So, well, you know, this is both an exciting but a scary area. I mean, just yesterday mm -hmm. a news story came out that says. The, the, what's DHS, I guess, uh, uh, Homeland Security, said, for the first time said that the, that the, they believe the Russians 
hacked into some of the voting systems. Yeah. And this is scary stuff, right? It, because this is a really serious uh, threat, right, to, yeah. to democracy. Without a doubt. But I'll tell you, the, the, the woman that said that, Jeanette Manfra, mm -hmm. she's a classic example of this, right? She got her, uh, she was, uh, had done military intelligence for the Army. Then she went to SICE mm -hmm. uh, at Johns Hopkins, the School for Advanced International Studies. Um, and she, so she did not come into this from a particularly hardcore technology background. Mm -hmm. And then she just got herself known. She came in as a GS, uh, you know, a, a general government worker and made her way up. And then now she's assistant secretary through just being competent, not from being uh, overly technical. Um, and now she's assistant secretary and she's um, looking to hire a student. So. <laughs> now, what I'd like to do, I'm going to ask uh, Jason another question, but what I'd like to do is to encourage people to, uh, you know, start to log in questions. And again, you can either do it through the chat function and just type in your question, uh, or you can do it in the, uh, there's a Q&A uh, feature as well. Uh, but uh, you can start to, you know, type in your questions if you wish. Now, I'm going to ask a, a, a second off-topic question, which is, you know, there are a lot of people who said the next war is not going to be fought with guns and, mm. and so forth, that it's going to be uh, fought with cyber, uh, cyber warfare. And it's a bit frightening because uh, cyber warfare doesn't require that you have huge amounts of money or lots of people, whatever. Yeah. I mean, you know, people say that the North Koreans hacked Sony and, and actually did a a couple of these other widespread, you know, malware, uh, yeah. you know, attacks. And, you know, obviously they're a small country with not a lot of resources. So it really makes you worry, right? That maybe yeah. one, that the uh, U.S. and other countries are, could, could be vulnerable, infrastructure, you know, mm -hmm. uh, power, all these things, uh, you know, but, uh, but also that it's a great equalizer, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just like nuclear weapons, the sad thing is they're cheap to build, right? Yeah. You know, uh, and, and, and I obviously are, you know, you need some skills, but apparently, you know, you know, there are a number yeah. of people who can build nuclear weapons. Do you have an opinion about that? Yeah, we've, it was one of the, the rules of thumb back in the 90s. Some of my friends, Neil Pollard, Matt DeVoe, they were writing about cyber terrorism and they, and they had a, uh, a rule of thumb that those with the capability lack the intent those with the intent lack the capability. So that the nations, the, uh, the adversaries that could really hurt us, mm -hmm. Russia, China, they don't really want to start a cyber war because they know if they start a cyber war, we'll they're starting a war. Right, right, right. <laughs> and, um, and we've been talking about a digital Pearl Harbor since 1991. Right, right. So 16, 17, uh, or 26 of, of the years, of the 76 years since the actual Pearl Harbor, we've been worrying about this digital strike from nowhere. And, and it hasn't come yet. Yeah. So, um, and part of that is because having, uh, it's easy to take a target down in cyberspace. It's really easy. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to keep it down mm -hmm. in the face of determined defenses. Mm -hmm. And that's really no different than, than war on the air land right. in space, right? right? I mean, you might be able to hit something, but they're going to come back. Now, what worries us is that, it, and hackers just haven't really had that capability, right? Yeah. I mean, even when you had them that have been minded to take down the internet like anonymous did right. it's really it's it's tougher than it looks yeah yeah to keep something down now the more that we do internet of things yeah. the more that we it, it was easy to take something down because cyber targets are made of ones and zeros they're made of silicon right, right? and you know as students you know when we're writing we all have a pay you know the computer eats your paper right yeah oh, god damn what happened to it i gotta start over again it happens, right? I mean, oh, but it's usually the dog, right? <laughs> right. It's not the computer, you're, it's the dog. Right? You're, yeah, the dog, the dog, <laughs> the dog and your hard computer. drive, right? right. And, and, and so you got to get a new hard drive, you got to buy a new laptop, it sucks, it happens, you move on. What we're worried about is now that we're doing the Internet of Things, mm -hmm. where now we're taking these, thing, these power grids, these dams, mm -hmm. um, hospitals, and we're connecting, we're putting those online. Mm -hmm. And now that we're putting things that are made not just of ones and zeros or silicon, but made of steel and concrete right. and we're connecting from the internet. Now people will start dying. We still, as far as from my research, no one has still, no one has yet died directly from a cyber attack. Mm -hmm. We're putting dams and power grids online. Yeah. We're going to start seeing people dying from cyber attack. And that means 
that hacker groups or, or these small groups that haven't had the capability yeah. to really have a strategic impact, strategic in the way that we talk about it in, in real national security terms. Now we're lowering that bar so that more can start reaching it. Well, I want to let you know personally I'm learning smoke signals and uh, Morse code <laughs> that is great. just in case I yeah. have to use yeah. it. And, and you're right about the Internet of Things, which is uh, we all really have to think about uh, what we connect to the internet in our homes and our offices, right? And uh, and and you got to think about the dark side as well, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because it exists, yeah. right? I guess it came out in the papers today that a lot of these smart TVs now people can hack in and and and, and all sorts of things. So um, of course, if they want to watch you eating popcorn and watching the Super Bowl, that may yeah. not, may not be that exciting. But yeah. you know, there are obviously other you know threats and so forth. So I guess you're saying. We should worry, but only to a certain extent, I guess, right? Uh, no, I think there's significant cause for worry. The, uh, there's a lot of debate in the cybersecurity community, especially on the policy side, of half of people look at the issue and say, look, nobody's died from this yet. There hasn't been a cyber war. This is not that big a deal, and we just, we just need to tone down the hype. Yeah. And then another half that said, that say, oh, my God, it's coming, right? Just because it hasn't hit yet. Um, this can get really bad. And, and I find myself poised on both of those of, mm -hmm. of um, you know, uh, of being the pragmatist and saying, you know, the, um, it, let's change our, let's, let's make sure we have really complex passwords because it's, it's probably coming. Yeah, no, that's right. By the way, I remember many years ago, I don't remember the name of this. I, wa I watched a film that was, uh, it was a long time ago, but it was all about how a company that, was able to manipulate the voting system you know, mm -hmm. put in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it was a classic film. I don't remember the, the name, but, mm -hmm. uh, but now, you know, how many years later, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but people thought it was going to happen sooner, but you know, yeah. well, you know, that's one thing, you know, those, you know, punching those holes actually, uh, may have some advantage, right? Because, uh, yeah, absolutely. you absolutely. know, because having the physical, uh, you know, uh, uh voter card, uh, you know, there's some things that are old fashioned mm -hmm. that are helpful, right? The, the, the Russians hacked the Ukrainian power grid um, in, in each of the previous two years. And uh, it was relatively easy for the Ukrainians to uh, come back because the system was um, relatively, uh, they, they could actually go to the fiscal circuit breakers. Yeah. And that's, that's actually quite difficult for us to do in the United States. Now we don't have those manual workarounds. We don't necessarily understand it. Um, the, so fortunately, this because this is happening slowly enough, mm -hmm. the power companies and others can start to say, all right, what will our manual workarounds be? Uh, the U.S. Air Force is just, uh, I believe right now, conducting their next red flag exercises in the mm -hmm. desert to tie this back to Top Gun. Mm -hmm. And they're doing it without GPS. So they're running right. their major exercise. Which makes sense. Um, yeah, I mean, the major thing that the Air Force does to practice for war, you know, um, uh, dozens, if not hundreds of aircraft, thousands of people involved, and they're doing it without GPS just so they can have the practice. Are they using smoke signals? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they probably are, actually, manually Well, they have marking, to have some way. To manually right? marking, marking targets with smoke, the old-fashioned way? Yeah. Yeah, they are going to be using smoke signals. You know, my wife and I went uh, on a trip to Estonia, mm -hmm. which is very mm -hmm. famous because it's one of three countries, I guess, that has gone seriously digital, yeah. right? Everything in Estonia is electronic. Yeah. I mean, you know, everything, payments, tax yeah. records, everything. But they're so afraid of the Russians or, uh, uh, you know, just taking the whole system down mm -hmm. that they literally they have an agreement with the UK where they back up all the yeah. country's data yeah. over to the UK. Yeah. And, and they're and, calling these digital embassies and they're trying to treat them like Estonian sovereign territory. Yeah. So in their embassies overseas, they have um, they have a little a mini data center, you know, a, a, you know, a couple of racks of servers yeah. to help back that up. Um, and they're especially worried about uh, property records. Like if they got taken over, if they were invaded, they want to know that their government in exile can function, can function, and that that this happened to them under the Soviets, where the yes, Soviets that's just why, destroyed the that, property records. Yeah, exactly. That's what, and and it, it it it's not that it wasn't theoretical, right? It, yeah, it really right, happened, right? Yeah, yep. exactly. Um, well, I'm opening up to questions, and I see there are a whole bunch of you online, but I don't see any questions yet. So it, it, we'd like to open up to questions, if anyone has uh, any questions. Well, 
if, and they you, do that through the chat they do that through the, the chat, chat function or okay. through the q a function but i don't jason you're so good that they don't <laughs> have any uh, by the way if 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 you weren't convinced that cybersecurity was important, I just listening to what Jason, you know, has to say, you know, makes it very clear that it's really important. And 10 years from now, when we look back and say, what are some major events that have occurred in the world? Almost certainly, there'll be some cybersecurity related ones on the list, right? Yeah, and, and if I can give two um, examples of the kinds of things that happen that I think bring together the that show you the, the, the wide range of areas that are involved. And, but the, and these examples are both probably four or five years old, I would mm -hmm. say. I was talking to one of my, one of my colleagues who uh, helped that bank's um, cyber threat intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, and the things that they were doing are as advanced as the things that are happening in, in many of the government intelligence agencies. Because they said, you know what, if our bank is going to be involved with, say, a um, Brazilian pre-sal oil lease. Mm -hmm. So one of these offshore oil um, uh, spots um, where you know, different companies are putting in a bid right. to drill, to, to explore there and potentially drill there. Um, if one of our companies is involved in bidding in that, uh, we we find out about those things, and then we say, all right, which of the Russian and Chinese um, state-sponsored hacker groups tend to be involved in looking at those kinds of negotiations? Because yeah. they'll try and steal the, each the other company's negotiating strategy and then right. underbid them. Right. And then they'll say, which group? Um, what what Chinese and Russian companies are going to be bidding against our client? Mm -hmm. Which hacker groups? tend to spy on those kinds of operations. Mm -hmm. What are their technical signatures mm -hmm. of how they tend to break in and steal things, which are provided by companies like, like FireEye uh, and CrowdStrike? Let's look within our own systems, and especially the business unit that's involved in that, and specifically look for those signatures of those Chinese or Russian groups um, within that spot. Right, this is really advanced intelligence-driven operations that bring together people that have to know deals, mm -hmm. that understand um, in the intelligence process, that understand Russia or China. Um, you're bringing in a whole lot of different aspects um, into this um, to try and get um, uh, to try and and deliver value for that comp uh, for that for that client. Mm -hmm. um, an incredible amount of, of folks, and you, know, you can get cyber insurance involved in these. It's it's really just a fascinating set of set of areas. Well, I I think I'm going to quit investment banking and go into <laughs> cyber security. You don't have to. You can do both. Oh, right. <laughs> well, I, to be honest, uh, it's one of the critical things that I have to worry about because if you're <laughs> running an investment bank, it's on your top five. And that's great. We, to, that's so wonderful to hear. You know, and and so and we have been extremely successful at. Uh, and, and, and we have some really unorthodox ways that we protect ourselves and, uh, yeah. and uh, uh, you know, which are unconventional, yeah. but it's based on knowing what the options are and saying, is there a way to do it that would be clever, right? Mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. would protect, give us more protection than what a conventional approach would be. Mm -hmm. But of course I won't dis disclose what it is, but uh, you know, you, you really, you really have to focus on these things if you're at all involved mm -hmm. with things where you're, you know, you're a target. We have a couple of questions. That's great. All right. So the first one is from Armand Aguilera, who says, uh, I work for Dark, Dark Trace, Trace, yeah. Dark Trace a cybersecurity company using unsu unsupervised machine learning and modeled after the human Im <laughs> uh, immune system to detect threats in real time. Wow, that sounds like a real good job. I was hoping to connect with you both and others in meeting to continue the discussion yeah. on cybersecurity and how his company is differentiating itself from these. I'd imagine would like to, oh, so you basically say, oh, you just want to find a way to have a yep. discussion afterwards, which uh, we'll, we'll, be, we'll look into that and yep. figure out. Yep. The second one is. Oh, well, and, and I can okay. say in, in general yeah. on, on, the, the, on the Yale side, 
you know, the work that Una Hathaway is doing is, is pretty well known, uh, partnering with McKinsey, the Yale Cyber Leadership Forum. Um, so, uh, uh, Aman, I don't know where, 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 you, where you are, but, you know, certainly I think in that connection with the existing, with the existing Yale pro projects, especially, especially the, te the teaming with McKinsey, um, I suspect there's a lot of other good things that are happening. Yeah, and by the way, what we might do, we, we, we don't, we're very careful about privacy, so we don't distribute the uh, registration list, but maybe one of the things we'll do is uh, invite everyone who registered for this to participate in a uh, uh, streaming video, just mm -hmm. one where the, everyone right. can talk. Yeah. So I might set that up and, and maybe invite you to yeah, be yeah. part of that. It, and yeah. can I pick on one other sure. part of what, what got brought up here is the technology that was looking after the uh, model on the human immune system, right? And this is an idea that's been around for, for um, a couple of years. It's nice to see it implemented. But right, it's getting to so much of the work in cybersecurity is modeled on analogies right. of, well, what do we think about as a human immune system? What if we think about it as uh, just insurance? What if we think about, and, and that's what helps other people from other fields get involved is because we're building these analogies on something that you might understand. The way that whatever your background is might be a great new way of thinking, of thinking about the field. And, and so, it really so, up. so Jason, um, maybe it may turn out by accident you'll discover a cure for cancer. Is that, is that it? <laughs> Unlikely. <laughs> Unlikely. Unless the answer is oh, a lot go, of coffee. It could go the other if way. If the answer is a lot of coffee, then yeah, yeah no, it, I'm, could, it, I'm could, on board. it could go the other way. The other question here we have from uh, David. Thanks for the great and helpful talk. Uh, if you were a relatively non-technical person with a deep business corporate strategy background who doesn't have a clearance and is job hunting in the DC area, specifically, uh, where would you look? Yep. Um, yeah, DC's, uh, DC's a different creature on this um, just because it is, um, so defined by the government and the defense industrial base um, in those areas, but I think the uh, the business and corporate strategy background opens up uh, McKinsey, which has great offices there. Um, all the consultancies, um, PwC, Accenture, ENY, KPMG, all all are set up there. Um, you've got uh, NGOs and other places like the corporate board, um, Ben's Business Executives for National Security. Um, uh, that have that have set up um, and so you've got a you've got a fair amount of space in that if you can do enough reading on the outside but one thing I didn't mention you can also take classes like um, Udacity or um, or others uh, or Coursera these free online classes and one of our, our colleagues uh, mine and David Edelman's and others um, uh, had put a name uh, Peter Rohde had put together a list of these that they used in the Pentagon so you can go to Coursera take some of their basic programming classes and exposure classes, um, and, and that will help give you some of the background that you need. We have a third question here. Are there a lot of opportunities for American nationals to work outside of the U.S. in the cybersecurity realm? Uh, w without a doubt, right? The uh, you know I was working for Goldman in Hong Kong, right? The um, any of the major capitals are going to have areas in this. Um, if you are if you're really technical, if you've got more technical then you can work anywhere. You can go and you can set up a local cyber, you know, a shop to help the cybersecurity for the small businesses, for the, for the large companies um, that, are, uh, that are working there. If you're on the policy side or on the, um, um, they're going to be a little bit narrower just because DC, I'm sorry, because the United States tends to be the largest market for those. Uh, but certainly if you're talking London, Paris, uh, one of my students just went back to Berlin uh, for jobs there. Uh, so they're definitely there especially the places where the multinationals gather. Well, we, we pride ourselves on starting on time and ending on time. And I, uh, first of all, really want to thank you, Jason, oh, for, fun. you know, what a wonderful conversation. Uh, and I, and, and I, I hope uh, those of you who are, are watching, uh, you know, really found this uh, uh, useful. It's an exciting area. It's a growth area. But also, there's so many different kinds of careers in cybersecurity. If you're interested in the area, it appears from what Jason is saying that, you know, even if you have different combination of skills mm -hmm. and you don't have to be a computer nerd, uh, <laughs> there's a place, there could be a place for you if yeah. you really, you know, feel there's a, yeah. there's, there's a fit. So I want uh, to do... Can I do one last piece oh, of yes. advice? Oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. One book. If you're going to read one book, it's called The Cuckoo's Egg. It's by a guy named Cliff Stoll. 
and it's a, and it reads like a thriller. It, and it was how he, as an astronomer, in 1986, uncovered a uh, a state-sponsored espionage um, incident into his uh, into his laboratory. It's called the Cuckoo's Egg. It reads very easily, and it, it's really a classic. You can you can easily knock it out on a weekend. So. Yeah, that's right. So uh, I'm sure all of you would join me in thanking Jason for oh, a wonderful session. And I, I remind you that uh, we have uh, 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 an upcoming Yale Career Panel on startups. Uh, and you can go, by the way, to YaleCareerPanels.com uh, and it will list future events, but also where you can register. And then, uh, and then the other uh, uh, is that we will have another one, our, our, our fifth one for this academic year, uh, uh, which is going to be on journalism and and uh, and publishing, mm. which will be uh, in April. Uh, and uh, by the way, uh, all of these uh, the sessions are recorded, and at least after the first three, so we have something like thirty of these are uh, available that you can watch. And all you have to do again is go to YaleCareerPanels.com, uh, and there's a session on you know mm. viewing previous uh, previous events. Uh, if you want to, if you want to listen to Jason again for, you know, on a recorded basis, or, you know, someone who just couldn't make it for this session. So thank you all. And, uh, we, uh, look forward to having all of you join, uh, some of the future ones as well. Thank you. Thank you.